And I love this series because we're, we're toning it down. We're focusing on God. We take away the, the, you know, all the bells and whistles and say, how about just our hearts and God? And my sermons are not as long either because we can sing some more. Instead of going 40, 45 minutes long in my sermons, I'm only going 35 minutes to 40, cutting five minutes short. <laughs> I usually print out my script every Sunday, and I, go, I try to time it to a certain font, certain spacing, roughly around 10 to 11 pages. So this week, I intentionally keeping it short and want to make sure we focus on worship, and I print it out, and it was 11 pages long. I was like, wait, that went way longer than <laughs> what I intended. So we cut out a couple of things. But, um, but our focus is really just we want you to bring your heart to the altar. And we started this series, and, and I tasked Tracy Twaddell last week, did a fantastic job of introducing this series. And I said, hey, I want you to explain what is worship. And a lot of times in the American culture, we interpret worship in so many different ways you know sometimes we got to have the candles or the certain lights or the, uh, the, the churches now have these mists that coming out to make it more meaningful and powerful and and uh, a lot of us will I fall into that trap as well it's like you got to have a nice coffee bar at the welcome center so people can have a good experience at church Right? You guys heard that before. Like, say, part of church. And we get lost into all the bells and whistles of the culture that we're living in. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that is how you worship, then we come so far, so far away from who God is and what He intended us to do. So, simply put, worship. It's just man recognizing God's revelation with the creation of God. And even simply, more simple than, 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 than that, it, it's just our conversation with God. That's what we're, it's just having a normal conversation with God. Before the Bible, before the church, before any of this happened, Paul and the disciples would walk out to the mountain and say, look at this mountain. That's how they preached. Look at this mountain. Who do you think created it? <laughs> and they said, look at the sea. God put it there. Look at your skin. Look at your hair. That's how they preached. And people were coming to worship God by the thousands and Jesus is walking down the street, and he said, look at the lilies of the field. Who clothed them? Look at the birds of the air. Who fed them? And people came to worship God by the thousands. So for the next few weeks, I want us to really focus on our heart of worship, bringing your heart to the altar. What if we don't have any of this stuff? What if we don't have a drum for the rest of the summer because he's out somewhere vacationing? Then what happened? Is our heart worshiping God less? I hope not. We're going to sing a lot of hymns, which I'm really excited about. And we want you to focus on communion. So I guess you can say, focusing on the heart, the worship, bringing our heart to the altar. Altar, it's, it's uh, described in the Bible, usually it's a place of remembrance, a place of hope, a place of rest, a place of worship, a place where people bring offerings and give thanks to the Lord. But most importantly, an altar is usually a place where people go when they recognize that they have been rescued. You know, when Liz and I met at the altar, 777, that's right, we're celebrating our 14th year of marriage in a couple of days. How many of you guys have been married for 14 years? <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. <laughs> we're making it. 
And not every day is a smooth sailing either, okay? Not every day is like that. Some days we fight and some days we go two days without talking to each other. <laughs> and on the third day, usually Liz initiate the conversation because I'm a man. I'm too stubborn to like put my pride down and go to my wife and tell her what's wrong. So she would have to say, what's wrong? And usually I would say, nothing. <laughs> We haven't spoken for two days, but nothing's wrong. She's like, oh, no, something's wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> so when we met at the altar, it's almost like she's rescuing me, but really we're rescuing each other from our singleness, from ourselves, our pride, our, our just who we are. So when we met at the altar, when we say I do, we're in a sense physically and spiritually rescuing each other. The first experience at the altar in the Bible, it's right after the flood. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed and burnt offering to God. That was the first altar experience. It wasn't something God commanded Noah to do. Noah just wanted to do that for God. Because he recognized he has been rescued. And throughout history, humanity has this desire, this, uh, this yearning to build something to worship God. But not necessarily interpreting who God is or not knowing who that God is. But there's this desire in humanity to want to build something to worship God. And you can see throughout history on this. This is the... The Iskon Temple. This is in northeast India. They carved this out of a mountain. And there's a change of these things. And they didn't have any, they didn't know who God was. This is dedicated to Buddha. And they carve out hundreds and hundreds of these all along the mountainside to worship something. And then we go to China. On the side of a mountaintop, they carve out the actual Buddha himself to worship something. And then we move to Greece in the Mediterranean. We see the temple of Baal worship. Man always had this desire all across the world, different corners of the world, to build something, some kind of altar for God. And of course, it, in Mecca, you know what that is? The holiest city in Saudi Arabia, where Islam is the religion. And they built this place, they call it, it's the Mecca of their religion. And every year, and if you are a part of this uh, community, or I would like to call it as a cult, you would have to travel there in order to complete your spirituality. And right in the middle of Jerusalem, Judaism, the root of Christianity, we have Solomon's Temple. And Solomon's temple, it wasn't God's idea. God didn't say, Solomon, I want you to go and build that for me to worship me. That was never the intention of God. It was actually his father's idea, David. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, turn your Bibles there. We're going to spend most of the time there and your attention. And I want you to get this. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. After the king was settled in his place, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in the house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for it is the Lord with you. But that night... The word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord say, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? <laughs> you can hear a little bit of sarcasm from God to Nathan to give this message to David. Are you really going to build me a house for me to dwell in? 
I have not dwelt in a house from <laughs> the day I brought you, the Israelite, up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent and my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, why have you not built a house of cedar? Listen to him and hear your attention up here. This is, this, sometimes I call these funny verses. Funny verses because you can hear the sarcasm of God to his people. He's telling David, David, are you really going to build me a house? Really? From generations to generations since I brought you out of Egypt and I called you as my people and you moved from, from place to place to place, have I ever asked any of your ancestors, your forefathers, to build me anything? Are you really going to build me a house of cedar? Oh, please. This is where we get it all twisted. An altar is not something we built for God. And that's not what God wants either. An altar is where God rescue us. An altar is a place in your heart where you know God rescue you. Throughout the Old Testament, God never desire a house. Matter of fact, God says, pitch me a tent. <laughs> This is where you're going to live. A couple miles away, pitch me a tent. Not the most attractive, the finest, doesn't have a coffee bar with Starbucks advertising on it. I personally like Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and I like Dunkin' Donuts gift cards. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> so, so God commanded Moses in the Old Testament, in Exodus, he says, pitch me a tent. Far off from the camp, he called it tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Here's a scenario. If they wanted to talk to God, there's this tent far off the camp with the Ark of the Covenant in it. And if they literally wanted to have a conversation with God, they have to go there. This is ingenious by God. Oh, hear me out, gang. Listen to this. The way God set this up, they would literally have to leave the chaos of their lives. They would literally have to step out of their village they would have to step away from their work. They would have to step away from farming, from their family, from their conflicts. They would have to step away from their success. They would have to step away from their daily routine to meet God, to have a conversation with God. They have to step away from their to-do list, their distractions. They would have to step away from everything that they're so used to during the day. And that one time they want to have a conversation with God, they set out to go to the tent of meeting. God. I wonder if that brings a whole new meaning to going to church. I wonder if that brings a whole new meaning of, oh, I got to mow the lawn today, so I'm, I'm going to miss church and mow the lawn. I wonder if that brings a whole new meaning to, well, I can't go to church today because I, I got in a fight with my, my wife and we haven't spoken for two days, so it's kind of awkward walking to church, being mad at each other, and so we're not going to go. I wonder if that brings a whole new meaning to literally setting aside a time in your life where you step away from your to-do list, the busyness to have a conversation with God, this intimacy, this altar that we know we've been rescued. And God continued this conversation with David. 
verse 8, Second Chance Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty say. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the name of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for you a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I have appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you the rest from all your enemies. So God went on and tell Nathan to tell David, I've always been with you. Building a house for me, it doesn't make your spirituality any closer to me than you already are. Making it your daily, your weekly, your time of separating from the hustle and bustle of life to recognize, God, that you have been rescued. The altar, it's not something we built for God. An altar is what God provided for us to meet him, a place where we can rest because we know we have been rescued. I love this series because it's, the songs, the, the tone down, this idea that I'm here because of that, not because of how cool it is from the stage, that we can rest. The altar is where our heart, our mind, our souls accept and acknowledge that there is a God in our lives, that we've been rescued throughout history. Humanity has this idea, this misinterpreted information of who God is or this higher power. So they started to place their faith in those things rather than the true God. And this happens all over the world in different continents. In Greece, in Greek, we have mythological gods. In Asia, we have achieving nirvana, becoming a god, the way of the Buddha. And then the teaching is, is if you can set yourself out a certain amount of time to just meditate and you're going to achieve this kind of lifestyle, and then if you die, you're going to reincarnate it back into something else. And if you didn't meditate enough, you're going to reincarnate it back into an animal or something. I tell you what, I love a mean piece of steak, medium. If Buddhism is correct, I've been eating a lot of my ancestors. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just being honest, okay? In Arabia, we have Islam. Muhammad is the last prophet. So because of political dissension during that time, he went into a cave, and several weeks or months later, he came out, and he said, I have a revelation from God. I am the last prophet, not Jesus. I am. So follow me because Islam is the new religion. Really? That's what we're going with. We're going with the guy who was running away from political issues into a cave and came out and proclaimed that, oh, Jesus is not the real prophet. I am. So don't listen to Jesus. Listen to me. And now let's follow Islam. That's, that's what we're going with. We're going to ignore the fact that Jesus, everyone wrote about him. Everyone saw him, the witnesses, and they, he resurrected from the dead. But let's ignore that. And people wrote about Jesus, but let's ignore that. But let's listen to a guy who says, oh, God only spoke to me in a cave. And you can't know this. Only to me, and I'm the last prophet, not Jesus. Really? That's, that's what we're going to go with. And here's the bonus. If you're a good Muslim, you have, you have a lot of wives when you die. 
do you think the men in that society would do? Sign me up! <laughs> Please! Sign me up! Camels and desert and many wives. All right. In Latin America, we have the Mayan, the pantheon gods. The, in, 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 in Latin America is so confusing to what to even worship because they, they had a god for everything. To the point where they built this altar where they got to go up there and then they would sacrifice babies and people just to cover their bases. In Africa, we have the sun god. Believing if they die and then you can wrap yourself up and mummify and you put in this, this coffin or this pyramid or this cave and take all your possessions with you as much as you can. You put it in there because after a certain amount of years, you get reincarnated and you can take all this stuff with you. That's what you're going with. I, I can tell you this. I'm not a bad looking guy. My wife tells me so, right? I'm not. I mean, come on. <laughs> but this is the last thing I want to take with me <laughs> if I die, okay? <laughs> this is the last thing I want to wrap up, okay? I have a 1999 Ford Expedition that the windows don't even roll down, which is embarrassing when my wife goes through the drive-thru at, co at coffee or whatever. So <laughs> she pull you pull up. You can't roll down the window, so you have to open the door. But if you pull too close, <laughs> then the door hits the wall. So you got to pull up a little bit, and you reach back, and you got to get your coffee. That's the last thing I want to put in my coffin to take it with me into my next life. <laughs> and if I want to take something to, with me in the next life, I want to take like six foot three of me, not five four. Listing is five seven, okay? Something like that. And that's what we're going with. So once and for all, God built an altar for us. They took Jesus. They walked him a mile and a half away from the city like a tent of meeting. On higher ground, so everyone can see, now it's fair game. There's no social classifications, no racial boundaries, no right or wrong political parties, no sin is too much, no righteous is too good. It's fair game that whoever believes in him shall inherit eternal life. And that's the altar God built for us. Amen? And the way Paul put this in Colossians, and the way you experience right now, it's what the early churches experienced. I want to ask you to stand, and I'm going to read this to you. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all creations, and in, all, in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether all things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What you just experienced, it's exactly what those people did in the Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America. They received this letter and they stood up and they said, all the things you're worshiping, it's not true. The one thing that's true in your life is they took Jesus. They walk him a mile and a half 
away from the city, away from the chaos, away from the trouble, away from the distraction, away from the to-do list, and he put him on the hill, and now is fair game. Because Jesus died on the cross, I can have a conversation with him, and that is the altar. And that's my story. And that is my song. And God provided an altar for us, all of us.